you made the joke about using the muzzle velocity off the box. Yeah. So it's it's more the BCs off the boxes that I feel sure. like because muzzle velocity in the Kestrel you true your muzzle velocity. It's part of using the Kestrel. You you go in and and true your muzzle velocity, and mm -hmm. then you really nail it into your exact gun profile. Mm -hmm. um, but the BC is typically in question. All right, what's up, everybody? Vortex Nation, we are here uh, in the podcast studio. I don't know when the last time was that we were in here, but anyway, Mark to my left as usual. We got Ruben across the table and also Katie Godfrey, right? Yeah. From Kestrel. And uh, so this is a cool visit um, that we have from uh, Katie and actually also the crew from Applied Ballistics is here too. So we're going to be chatting with them at some point. Stay tuned for some of these episodes. But right now, uh, Katie being here, we wanted to chat a little bit about your guys' awesome devices and technology. Uh, huge, huge aids to shooters, uh, especially, we're going to say, especially, I think it, it's it's fitting long-range shooters, which we know many of our listeners out there, um, based on, you know, when we see all the downloads and all that stuff coming in, a lot of people super interested in the long-range shooting stuff. And as we've talked about in some of our previous podcasts, I don't think it can be talked about enough is how much environmentals and the ballistics and just the air and atmosphere that our bullets have to travel through on their way to the target, uh, how much that affects it all. If we shot in a vacuum, I don't know, we might not need Kestrels. Might so not, yeah. I guess, yeah, you guys are big proponents of like the no vacuum. No vacuums. Don't vacuumize the world. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, um, but anyway, so yeah, we'll have you introduce yourself though. Uh, we were just chatting here a little bit before the podcast. Pretty cool. Like how long you've been with Kestrel and all that stuff and some of your background uh, and even Kestrel's background too was, I didn't even realize, uh, what they came out of and all that stuff. So yeah, Katie, we'll give you the floor here. Yeah, sure. So Katie Godfrey, um, I've been with Kestrel for 21 years and I actually started the parent company is Nielsen Kellerman. Nielsen Kellerman started as a rowing electronics company. So back in the 70s, the two founders were working at Xerox. They saw, they got invited down to a, a regatta. They saw coxswains running their boats into bridges, trying to scream at, at their rowers, and they figured that they could fix it. So they started with voice amplification that went all the way through the boat, and then they started to do more with boat speed and using impeller-based boat speed and all of that. Um, eventually that translated into a wind impeller. So doing an anemometer, which is how Kestrel began. Um, and, and it's kind of evolved since then. When I started at Kestrel, there was three Kestrels. There was a Kestrel 1000, a Kestrel 2000, a Kestrel 3000. And that was it. And that was in 1999. Hmm. Um, now we have, I'm not even sure how many different SKUs we have. Um, I've been lucky enough that I have been able to kind of push my way over. So all I do is ballistics now. I don't deal with any of the other markets, although I still have to have knowledge of them. So we do have, you know, general weather. We have storm chasers. We also do drag racing. We have special kestrels for all these different applications. But ballistics is where I focus and I love so much. Wow. You had, so you cool. had Jimmy at racing. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I didn't even have to. It's just my eyes. Uh, <laughs> But um, that's that's awesome. I also saw, I was looking around your guys' website, it, it, and to your point, there are so many things that Kestrels can be involved in. There's there's really so many things, I mean, just that we're affected by in, you know, our world and the atmosphere. Um, but there is stuff with, uh, with like, fire. Oh, um, yeah, wildland firefighting is huge for us because... Yeah. Oh, my gosh, Relative yeah. humidity, wind speed, all of that affects how mm. that fire is going to spread. And it also makes decisions for prescribed burns, but then also the firefighter safety of making sure that they have the, the right distance as they're going into valleys, how that, how that fire is going to traverse, all of that. Yeah, yeah I imagine there's definitely a, a predictive aspect to it, you know, as far as, like, what's going on with, you know, the atmospherics and the weather. And yeah, for yeah. sure. Man. And Kestrel's really big. I've been really big. I love to do stuff. So um, one of the things that we like to do is when we get into a market, we actually get involved in the market. So I went out to Colorado and went through the Wildfire Academy, and I'm a certified wildland firefighter. Whoa, that's awesome. That ne is never really actually, cool. But super cool. I spent a week doing the spike camp um, and, and got certified and did all of that. But it was a really good way to understand exactly what they needed mm -hmm. rather than yeah. us just try and engineer something and say, here's what you should have. And we've done the yeah. same thing in shooting where we, we are not, I'm not a shooter. I started off not being a shooter at all. Now I have, I think it's seven, maybe seven or eight rifles that are all mine that, 
you know, I play around with all the time. I take yeah. them out to different ranges. I love to share them with other people, but um, I love shooting. I've shot 2.2 miles is my longest shot. Okay. Wow. I'm sure Kestrel helped. <laughs> I'm sure Kestrel helped. Using a Kestrel. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Wow. I can't say I've shot that far, to be perfectly honest well, with I you. Well, I think I, I may have shot Mark that far. Mark probably has. has. <laughs> I think, yeah. Maybe. They call that cooking one off. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> that's a desk pop. Oh, okay. yeah. Well, then I have too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a thing here too. Yeah, that's exactly. Cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not that it happens. Oh, you didn't do your desk pop yet? I haven't done my desk pop yet. Oh, my God. Oh, eight. How uncourteous of us. We got a section of the building that we just purposely didn't finish off just for... Well, um, the range. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Uh, But you must have then gotten into... uh, Did you get into Kestrel through rowing then? Is that how that happened? Yeah. So I was a coxswain, um, and after I graduated from college... Can you explain what that is? (laughs) Yeah, good good, good call. I don't know. I'm the the only uncultured one here. (laughs) We were talking about like recruiting for the rowing teams around here because UW has a pretty good one. And I was saying how like in my high school, if you were over six foot something, you got just automatic letter because they're just trying to get big people. But then the coxswains seem to not have to be really tall. We're pretty little. (laughs) Yeah. So we're just dead weight. You know, we're just a voice. We're the on water coach. Hmm. So the coxswain is the the boats are are very long and they have eight rowers in in a row. And so the coxswain has to take the voice of the coach and put that through the race Got it. and all the practices and everything else. So okay. I'm bossy and I have a big voice and that's how I <laughs> ended up there. That's how it happens. Yeah. And there's an Im- impeller. You said an impeller, not a propeller. An impeller. Propeller okay. would be super awesome. Pro- Make the boats go fast. Yeah. But right. the okay. impeller is what's measuring that water speed. Okay. And we've moved completely away from that. Everything is GPS based now wow. for water right. speed. Um, the current can throw that off, right? Well, or? actually, it's better to have, yes, yeah, absolutely. But if you think about GPS, you're just looking at land-based speed. Sure, yep. And there's times when rowers, um, where we're located, we're right around Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. So the Schuylkill River has a current. And when they're rowing upstream, and then when they're rowing downstream, their GPS speed's going to look like they're going super slow when they're going right. upstream, which is true. But the force of the water when they're going up above, above the current, they're, they're actually still going. traveling at... A yes. higher nautical or knots, but not yeah. actual on the on the actual earth. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Their position isn't changing as fast, huh? Right. Through so it's water. kind of like so you if like you're to look at the speed when you've got an impeller and you're going upstream. Yeah. If you think about <laughs> it, if you're if you're working out on a treadmill, like your GPS watch is like, yeah, you're not moving. You're, you're literally, yeah. Okay. Right. Yep. Meanwhile, still. the treadmill's going faster yeah. and faster underneath you. It's okay. the same as rowing into a current. That's fair. Yeah. Interesting. That's so a, that's a, that's a, a knot, a knot then, is like 1.2 miles per hour. Oh boy, no, yeah. that's beyond miles, me. I think it is. That's like to ask cool. me what an MOA is. <laughs> okay, we won't ask that then. <laughs> Fair enough. Stick with Mills. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, okay. So yeah, then the basically hydrodynamics switch over to or carry over to aerodynamics. I've been reading a lot up on aerodynamics. Listen to that, especially yeah, Jim. What's with, going on with, here? This with, is like well, a like the, it's couple times lately. Kestrel was coming in. AB was coming in. I got a book on aerodynamics. I was all very interesting. That's like stuff. a normal thing for people to do. Yeah, <laughs> it's not okay. All right. Well, you anyway, got something up your sleeve. I'm not ve- quite sure what it is. It is very interesting, the, the, though, how air and, and fluids actually connect very similarly. But uh, okay, so you guys have um, it's like a mobile weather station, right? Yeah. Kind so of. the Kestrel is it is it's a handheld weather station, and mm-hmm. you know, like when we first started, we were, we were like, oh, it's Al Roker in your pocket. You know, it's something that you can carry around. <laughs> Anywhere that you go for whatever microclimate that you are in, you can get the actual environmentals. So even people that are using, not to go back to the ballistic side, but if you're using an app, which there's a lot of great apps out there, if you're just using the environmentals from your phone, it's mostly coming from an airport. And that airport is in a totally different microclimate than yeah, where you're actually weather shooting. weather stations, right? Yeah. So it could be an airport or a cell tower or, or something like, like yeah, that. The I guess area I never high thought school. of them coming from yeah. airport. Wait, so where are weather stations, actually? I always just thought that they were just at the place that it does the broadcast. Well, it depends. <laughs> yeah, so some of them will be like at the TV station. And if you look at, there's some, some weather apps where you can see where the weather stations are located. Yep. Okay. A lot of times, at least one of your schools in your area, either your high school or middle school, one of them will have a weather station up. And a lot of those apps are just pinging the closest weather station to try and be as accurate as possible, but it's still not exactly where you are. Well, when, so we were out this morning at the Coon Rock facility and 
when you're at Coon Rock facility, your weather station, because one of the apps I use has a, it shows you where it's pulling from. Yeah. And so it'll pull from about 15 miles northwest of us. Okay. In yeah. the river va- or outside of the river valley. And mm. Coon Rock is in the river valley. So the wind is always completely different. Like, yeah, and you even can, that, I can, I can be reading on my app that the wind is like, West southwest, like a couple hundred yards away, the wind can. Oh my gosh! Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. the wind and temperature too. I mean, and then even density altitude. You know, like thinking about pressure fronts. A lot of times they'll follow down by a river. So if you're Mm -hmm. looking at something that is getting readings from there, they they could have a totally different pressure, Mm -hmm. which that density altitude will absolutely change the flight path of your bullet. DA is pretty crazy because that that takes into account you have on the earth a physical elevation that you are at in relativity to sea level but what the uh not like theoretical or whatever but what the actual um feeling of elevation might be i don't know if that's the word either can be different from what your physical elevation might be just because of this thing called DA. Yes, right? yeah. So density, people have confusions over barometric pressure, station pressure, all these different terms and what they actually need in shooting. Density altitude, we, we use station pressure. Like the bullet could care less what altitude you're at. The bullet just knows what pressure it's feeling when it leaves your rifle, right? So mm-hmm. that density altitude is telling it. it. It may be that you're up in the mountains or it may be that you are down by the ocean, but some pressure front has come in, and yeah. it's the density altitude that affects that flight path. It's I, it's I, a relative altitude, basically. I explain okay. it okay. kind of like the people that, when you tell them, like, you're from Wisconsin, and they're like, oh, wow, it's only 70 degrees up there. Well, it's 95% humidity, so it's like the real feel temperature. Sure. <laughs> it's yeah. like, it might only be 70, but it feels like it's 95. Yeah. Or the people from the south that always say, but it's a dry heat. Oh, boy. It's not. Or the Midwesterners. I've been down south. It's it's a wet dog on humidity. (laughs) Um, But yeah, we get we get that for sure up here. No matter what, the important thing is we complain about the weather. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think we're all united in that front. (laughs) Yeah. Everybody, everybody in the country can be united in that. Yeah. Unless you're from Texas, then it's worse than everywhere else. No matter what it actually is. The big. (laughs) It's the biggest worst. (laughs) The biggest worst. Now everything is bigger. Um, okay. So your guys, uh, your guys, Kestrels will be able to sense, I guess, DA, right? Or they can tell you what DA so is, right? all the sensors they are can, on board on the Kestrel. It they has, can sense all kinds of things. Yeah. So they have, they have, we have four main sensors, right? The barometric pressure, a barometer. Mm-hmm. So doing barometric pressure. We have the thermistor doing temperature. We have, um, a hygrometer, which is how you measure relative humidity. And then the impeller is measuring the wind speed. Okay. So when you put those combinations together, you also get other derivatives like dew point. What's the difference altitude. between an anemometer and an impeller? An anemometer is. There you is, go. It is. An anemone. An anemone. See an anemone. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the impeller is the actual thing. Okay. And an anemometer. And see, you just got me. Anemometer would be the device. Okay. So an okay. anemometer is any kind of wind measuring device. Got it. All right. Okay. But the impeller does the work. But the impeller does the work. Cool. Yeah. And ours is unique because it's replaceable. I know. That blew Whoa. my mind the first time that happened. I thought right. it just broke. So no. So it's, the Kestrels are not an inexpensive thing. Sure. This is a moving part. The impeller's in a moving part. So it's a $19 replacement part. Um, we had people, before we got into shooting, because the shooters like to do a whole other round of things to destroy their Kestrels, but they would drive along in the highway and hold their Kestrel out to see how fast their car was going, stuff like that. Um, we also, hand dryers, if you put your Kestrel under hand dryer, you can see how much force is coming out of that. So, I mean, oh, that's wow. just good I information. Feel like I, got a, I feel like I if know, I got a Kestrel, I know what I'm, I'm doing tonight. Have way too many so, fun things to yes, try and do. And our hand dryer, so it, it maxes out, the specs out at 89 miles per hour and our hand dryer goes beyond that, at about 115 miles per hour, the impeller will actually explode. It pulls apart, which has happened in our hand dryers at work. So we well, all know that they're over. Right. They're super they fast. They got Dysons. Yeah. <laughs> they're not that there is something like that. Yeah, That's interesting. I thought we were anti-vacuum. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's right. Well, not, it's not a vacuum. It's blowing. Vacuum. Yeah. Just but wait until Dyson well, we got, sets up we got a shooting Dyson facility. Dyson guy over here. You see, what we've done is we've taken the shooting <laughs> facility. We've made it so much better. Um, Lighter, faster. 
Wow, where were we? So you guys have all these sensors essentially in this thing. So everything's on board, yeah. yeah. But we still weren't in the ballistics market. We were going to Shot Show just because we're like, oh yeah, this is another outdoor show. Yeah, this was weird kind little of... niche market seems to be paying a lot of attention to the weather. And... Yeah, so I think um, I started in '99. I uh, our first Shot Show I signed us up for was 2001. So that's when we started going to Shot. And one of those years, we were sitting across the booth from a guy that had a ballistics calculator. And we would watch people talk to him. And then he's like, well, you need weather. And we're like, hey, we're right here. So we ended up pairing up. Um, the first ballistics calculator was in a PDA. And then the Kestrel would talk. The guys would actually read their Kestrel and input the information. Hmm. Then we got it to Bluetooth into the PDA. And then we took that all that PDA information and put it into the Kestrel, which was the first big move. And that so, was. Oh, yeah, that's the ultimate. It sounds like right a good there. time to explain maybe some of the different levels of what you make for shooters. Mm -hmm. Sure. So we have, we now have a line of ballistics calculators. So they start with the Kestrel 2700. We have the 5700. We have the Elite and then the 5700X. Those are all of them. Um, in the 2700 line, it's, it's AB Ultralight is powering it. So it's really made for um, beginner shooters. It's a single gun, single target. So you load and go. You play everything with the app, and then you just take your Kestrel and walk away. There's some limitations to it because it only talks to your phone. It won't talk to any other connected devices. Sure. Um, and being AB Ultralight, it also limits to 800 meters. Hmm. So um, we want to make sure that every, every bit of information we give you is accurate. So we cut it off there because beyond that, you need more information that you can't get okay. Okay. in that yeah. 2700. Um, then we move into the 5700, and the great thing about the 5700 with AB is that it is field upgradable to the Elite. So somebody that's looking to get into this product, the 5700 holds three gun profiles, um, single target, but it at any point, they just go in and they ask for a firmware upgrade. We email it to them based on their serial number, and now they have an Elite. So it's a really great thing that you don't end up with this obsolete piece of kit that you're throwing at the bottom of your safe, you don't mm -hmm. know what to do with, or you're trying to sell on eBay. You just upgrade, and the Kestrel kind of grows with you. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. What, do you, what do you mean by single target? Yeah, I was going to ask that, too. Yeah, so single target. Um, on the Elite, we have a target card, and we have a range card, where you can look at the range card you can build out, look at increments between 10 to 100 yards or meters. Oh, okay, I get it. It's and like you a, can it, see multiple targets at once. Yeah, like a dope card. So, yeah, so it is if, a dope I, card. if I knew that I was, you know, if I'm shooting at 200 and then I want to go to like 450, instead of having to like Finger, re plug in yep. everything, it's just, oh, that's what my 450 dope is. Oh, okay. And, yeah. then, and then the... And the target, target card. card. Target yep. card is uh, customizable. Right now it's 10 targets. So you can program those 10 targets, any different direction of fire, you know, range card, dope cards, you're thinking of single lane. So you're shooting single lane. The target card, you can be shooting all different degrees. Oh, I see. You so can you input like, your win differently. Yeah, yeah, like three, then five, then seven, back to 250. Yeah. You so know. for like competitive shooters, it's a really good one for PRS shooters. They can kind of set up stages. It's also great for hunters if they know, you know, here's like four spots where I'm pretty sure... I'm yeah. going to have it. Then you have that pre-programmed in. Oh, that's okay. pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's another upgrade that you get when you go up to the Elite. Got and the it. Elite also then opens up Brian Litz's custom drag model. So those CDMs, which are critical. Everything else um, on the 5700, you're just doing, I should say, not just, but you're getting a G1, G7. Mm -hmm. To get into the custom drag models and the personal drag models, like we're doing this week down at the range, mm -hmm. um, you need the Elite for that. Okay. What's the X? Yeah, 5700X. So it's our newest one. Um, it's really just a beefed up Elite. So we wanted to make sure that we had the fastest speeds for anything that's coming down the road, any new software, any firmware that comes through. Um, so that's what the 5700X is. It has a bigger processor in it. It also uh, was developed for the, specifically for the military. So with Bluetooth, military is sometimes okay, sometimes not okay having Bluetooth, right? Okay, right. Right. Um, but in this day and age, they need Bluetooth. The majority of everything they need, they want to be able to have Bluetooth. So yeah. we changed up our Bluetooth where it's now, instead of just being on or off, when it's on, you can dial it. So between a range of low to high with two, three, four, five, you can change what that range is going to be. So if I want my Bluetooth to reach you guys, I'd put it at like a two or a three. And then nobody with a sniffer, it's harder for them to sniff out where my Bluetooth yeah. is. If I have it blasting at a 10, it's a much bigger signal for people to, yeah. to pick hmm. up on. Okay, got it. So that unit, is that uh, 
available to the general public or not? It really? is commercially available. Okay. We actually weren't going to make it commercially available. We um, supplied the military with it early this year. And a lot of those guys end up buying personal units. Yep. And so Absolutely. once we had enough demand, they we want to use cool. what they used in the, yeah. For sure. Yeah. If, if you get yeah issued something, you want to also be able to take it home. I mean, the Kestrel is a great learning tool. So being able to take it and actually use it to learn things is mm. it's my favorite part of it. Yeah. That's a huge part of getting familiarized with them is just time, like figuring yeah. it out. Like you can do stuff wrong and it doesn't break it, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is a big part of like what I've learned over the last few years of using one is that like you have to just play with it a lot. I was kind of wondering if it's almost like when somebody gets, you know, I, I think you can probably speak to this um, and I, I would assume it's probably fairly similar. A lot of people will get a first focal plane rifle scope with a really technical reticle yeah. and they say like, gotta have it. Like I can't not have it. And then they get it, and they just wind up dialing and shooting off the center reticle all the time. Yeah. And mm-hmm. they're sort of, and you're, you're like, hey, that's fine. It works that way, you know. Yep. But did you really need it then? And they never really want to try venturing out and, well, I'd have the ability to hold over and do yep. this or ra- mill that, range that. Do you find that, you know, there's just so many features on your more elite models that, that people don't tap into enough? A hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. There's, I mean, we definitely have elite users that do the most basic and they probably could have gotten away with just getting the 5,700, but they wanted the best, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it can be, it's an intimidating thing. It's got all these buttons, like there's a lot to put in there. Um, but as long as you play around with it, you know, we actually, I started with COVID, lockdown, I wasn't getting out to the range as much. I wanted to still be able to reach out to shooters. So we started, I do a Zoom class every two weeks. It's a live Zoom class. Anybody around the world can sign up for it and they can just jump in and it's live and interactive. So they're asking specific questions that are coming up to them. And it's been fantastic because we're finding some of the questions that we didn't really anticipate as being a common question and we can Mm -hmm. answer them in a group setting and then we send it out to everybody and, and it helps. What do you find are some of the things that people get most kind of nervous about and don't use? Is it, is it some of like, are, are there some of the atmospherics or whatever that they just, they just let it do the default thing. They're like, eh, I don't really want to mess around with it's, checking that or changing that or. It's a little bit more like we always say garbage in is garbage out. Of course you have to figure out, but figuring out what matters is the really hard thing for people to grasp. And people come in with preconceived notions where they're like, well, this, this is the most important thing. And the Kestrel lets them check it and see whether or not it is the most important thing. Oh, okay. So I've had debates with people, you know, bore height. How critical is it to get that bore height exact? And I've had guys, you know, love them to death, out with calipers five times, measuring over and over again to get exactly right. Well, it turns out if you build it out and build a saffron gun within a quarter of an inch, bore height's good. So obviously going out to extreme long ranges, when you shoot farther and farther out, 2.2 miles, bore height, you want to get the calipers out and measure it. But sure. um, it's it's within within the rifle's limitation. Whenever you're shooting, certainly whenever you're shooting within supersonic, when you start to pass into transonic, early subsonic, a lot of those things that you thought were so important because you were taught that, the Kestrel shows you what is important and what isn't. Hmm. Yeah, we were we were doing a little shooting last summer with Chris from uh, Applied Ballistics, and we're trying to figure out, you know, why we're kind of wonky at 1,100. It was like we're spot on to 1,000. Why is the 1,100 target? Why are we dancing around it, right? And the, and we just like you said, we go through, we, we measure height over bore. We measure, like, chronograph of velocity. We go through all this stuff, and we're like, the scope's tracking perfectly. The reticle is to scale. Everything is working. What's going on? And we end up figuring out it's something that is, like, beyond my level of knowledge at the time of what makes a bullet fly or what makes our, our dope right. And it was like gyroscopic stability. And it's like, yeah, we could sit there and measure with the calipers, our height, our height over bore and what kind of, you know, ev- everything else about it, parallax, right? Optical things. Uh, nope. It ends up being something completely like way more in depth. So I think you're yeah, right. Like your bullet's typically, tumbling. Or, yeah, yeah. Yeah. At that point, the bullet wasn't stable. That's why we were missing. Interesting. Yeah. So and the Kestrel can tell you, hey, you're, you're in subsonic. Yeah, absolutely. It's gonna be less predictable because now you're in subsonic. Yep. Yeah. Talk about it. so that is you're talking about like 
when you say subsonic and supersonic, we're talking about the speed of sound. Right. You know, so we have intimidating things than, there too. Yeah. yeah. Faster than or slower than the speed yep. of sound. And then there's this transonic region, which is um, it's right in between. And so first off, speed of sound is Mach 1. I don't recall actually what the miles per hour is. It's Mach 1. Mach so one. when we Mach say you're one. going into subsonic, it's when you hit 0.9 Mach. Okay. And so Mach values have a different foot per second value at different elevations or at different density altitudes. And so oh. you can be in one place and a certain and 1100 feet per second is Mach 1 or Mach 1.1. Yeah, that's right. And then right. you can be here in Wisconsin and today like Mach 1 or whatever Mach 1.1 is like 11 20 or something like that. Hmm. Yeah, it's the same or thing we were just saying. Nine, it's, the bullet doesn't care where you are, but it's that pressure that's going on the bullet, and that's yep. what's going to affect it, slow hmm. it down, speed it up. Temperature, pressure, that stuff mm-hmm. changes your Mach value. But if we were talking about very like where we are in Wisconsin, we're at like 750 feet elevation at the range that we were shooting at. So today it was like 1070 or something like that. Okay. Where we're where we're kind of like hitting at point nine. Does the Kestrel tell you that then? Yeah. What what Absolutely. Mach one is yes. that yeah. day in that place? That's what's yeah. really cool oh, about it. Cool. So the, yeah. the whole supersonic crack thing or when you're shooting a subsonic round like a three hundred blackout, you take it somewhere, take it to Colorado and you shoot and it's like it's cracking. Why is that round cracking? Cause, well, it's too fast. Now you take it back here and it's not. Is Mach one a lower speed down here than it is at a higher elevation or drier climate? You're asking the wrong person. I, I didn't. Mean I, to believe, trap you. I believe. I believe. <laughs> you just said there was going to be no I know, trapping. I told you there'd be this. no gotchas, but now I got you. If apparently. I thought, if I really thought through it, and we had radio silence on here for like 45 seconds, I could probably figure it out. But five seconds. Um, that's in the interest long. of not saying radio anything. Camp. Yeah, in in the interest of not saying anything incorrect. Um, where were we going with that, anyways? Oh, we were talking about ask, transonic. Like, where? Right? My, oh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, transonic. Those as your transitioning it's where you're going from supersonic speeds to subsonic yeah. speeds and there's yeah. a there's so a when window. you think about the path right the transonics is just a quarter it's just a small sliver of the flight path of the bullet sure so it has this long time in in supersonic and then a little bit of time in transonic and then it's spreading out to subsonic mm. a lot of people will ask too like why why i can shoot this rifle and after it hits transonic and goes subsonic i'm my my numbers are wrong. It's not as accurate. I'm not hitting where I should be. Why can I shoot a 300 blackout subsonic out to 400 yards and it's accurate? Sometimes it's because it doesn't really have to pass accurate. through. It's yeah. Never, it, yeah, yeah same with that. 22 rim fires, right? They're, if they're starting subsonic and they don't have to pass through transonic zone, yeah. they're not going to be... Kind of One of the ways that I've been explained to, and it's, it's, it helps me visualize what that transonic zone is like for the bullet, it's a por- portion where it's kind of unsupported. Right, so the bullet is passing through atmosphere, passing through, and it's supported the whole way until it gets to that transonic zone. So it's like you're swimming underwater in a pool, mm-hmm. and you hit a big bubble in the pool, and now you're not supported. Well, if you're passing through that zone fast enough and you're stable enough, you would pass through it fairly uninterrupted into the subsonic, which is the other side of the bubble, where again you're supported by the water. That's my new band name. Into the subsonic. There you go. <laughs> You'd have to have all lame songs about long range was, shooting. Though. <laughs> I thought it was going to be underwater bubble. Nobody would get oh. it. Oh, okay. That's my new band name. There oh. you go. So, but yeah, or or some people explain it as like going from supersonic to subsonic is kind of like passing through a, a sheet of water, like yeah. a vertical sheet of water, and 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 things get interrupted. So weird. But when we were talking a little bit about stability, it's. And you guys will talk about that with applied ballistics too. But the the stability of the bullet is kind of like the rate at which it's spinning based on how long the bullet is and the weight. Mm-hmm. How stable is that bullet? So you have to have a certain gyroscopic stability, meaning the bullet is spinning fast enough that it's not going to be thrown off of its trajectory or off of its path as it becomes unsupported briefly. Right. What happens to planes when they go... <laughs> Transonic. Oh, that's actually another thing. So oh, I mean, I always see, always see that, all excited about see that weird yeah. cone around yeah. them when they're going yeah. into supersonic, or I guess just when they're like hanging out. It's when out they break the sound them. barrier. Yeah. So yeah. So but well, that's what a weird. Thing that's kind of a different is. topic. We're gonna have to. Well, yeah. We'll, in regards to planes, when you're flying and you hit turbulence, and that plane feels like it drops out, it's because yeah. there's a change in barometric pressure in that microclimate where you're not as supported. So. That's oh. that turbulence. That's actually, it's not like, typically it's not like you're crossing a, a wind current. It's 
you hit a bubble. Okay. Can I ask you, speaking of like barometric pressures and stuff like and sensors that you guys have in your mm-hmm. in your guys' cash rolls and everything. Okay, so I have I have a watch, right, that has like sensors on it or sure. whatever. And yep. and I didn't buy it for the sensors. I bought it because it was a watch and whatever. I don't know. Um but so my wife and I were just in Colorado and we're hiking around. And so for fun, I remember it like, oh, I my thing, this thing says what altitude I'm at. And so I, you know, click the little altitude button as we're like hiking up this mountain just to see how high we are. And uh, the thing was like way off. Way off, yeah. Way off. It wasn't even close. Yeah. And so I, and I remember thinking to myself then, I'm like, I'm like, well, we got the folks from Kestrel coming in, you know, and I'm like, I'm like, man, wouldn't it be cool to have a Kestrel here because it would be so much more accurate, I'm sure. But then I was wondering to myself, like, well, what is so inaccurate about these things like so, it's got to yeah. be just maybe cheap or something i don't know or no, whatever it is pressure but. sensors are are all pretty similar but they're it's a pressure sensor so okay. you have to give it um you have to set it so you have to give it a reference okay so the pressure sensor you can either and especially on the kestrel but on most of the watches you either set a reference altitude or you set a reference barometric pressure hmm. most people when and this does not affect the ballistic side. Anything you do on the weather side of the Kestrel is its own little world, its own bubble. But once you move over to the ballistics, that weather will apply. Um, so if I mess around with what my barometric pressure says on my on my weather side and I come back over, my holds will not be changed. My holds will continue to take the weather that I've pulled in accurately for my Kestrel. Okay. Back over to that, though, you set a, a reference barometric pressure or reference altitude. Most people will know an altitude. Like if you're hiking... You're like, oh, here's a sign, and it says this is where our altitude right. is right here. So you can set your reference altitude, okay, and then and and then your barometric pressure as that pressure is changing, your your whatever you're using, whatever the barometer is, will say, yep, you're clearly climbing up, you're going down, or mm-hmm. you can use it for even ski runs. You know how many runs you've had. Okay, you can track all of that until a storm front comes through. Yeah, because the storm front comes through and doesn't the pressure usually drop? Yeah, typically there's a big drop in pressure. So if you see, it's like, I'm not moving and it says my altitude's going up. Yeah, so we would get calls from people. They're like, well, I'm still sitting in my house. And in my house, my house just changed altitude by 250 feet. And we're like, well, you have a storm. That's that's what's oh, happening. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> look outside. Is there a rain cloud? <laughs> Are you in my house? <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. That would be interesting. Okay. All yeah, right. I have a- but yeah, I was getting frustrated though after a while because like we we're on a really tough hike and we we're going up and the thing wasn't moving actually. Like it just oh. stopped. Okay, and well then, that's weird. Yeah. Well, I but I have a, I have a similar watch, experience. But- I, have a, I have a Sunto which has a onboard sensor, mm-hmm. and I've had the same experience in Utah. Drop names, Ruben. Well, it's because if you own a Sunto, you have to say you own a Sunto. It's like CrossFit? No, I don't know. It's probably it's some CrossFit hiker thing. <laughs> I'm trying to be a poser, really. Like, All right. You know, how you can buy being cool. So I'm yeah. a poser. No. With a Casio. No, a Casio <laughs> no, is I'm not. names. Come on now. A Casio is a fine piece of equipment, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's I good. Like my no, it's Casio. Good. It's, uh, it's good for you, Jim. I only yeah, said the name smart. because it's a pretty reputable watch brand. Very much. And I was having the same thing. Where it was like I'm going up and it's not changing. Yeah, I was like I've been at eleven thousand. It was changing, it was changing like really slowly, but okay. we did. And of course, an hour later, it just started thunderstorm started raining. Mm, right. Yeah. So you were going up as that storm was coming mm-hmm. through. So you're just pressures, negating yep, anything. Pressures lo- dropping. Well, come to think of it, too, like when you're in the mountains in Colorado, it basically rains every day too. Yep. So that was happening. Anyway. I was very curious about that. I was like super excited to ask that. Like, yeah. What the heck was going on? But okay. Got That's it. what's happening. Yeah. 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 So your Casio is just fine, Jim. It is. It's good to know. It's functioning. If you ever want to borrow uh, mine, you can. <laughs> 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 um, okay. So then, you know, obviously the Kestrel's pulling in all this data. And on the actual device itself, you can then have your ballistic profiles put in from your rifle. And I love that you mentioned, you know, you put crap in, get crap out. Yeah. It, it can't be iterated enough. There's so many times I know, I'm sure you guys have seen it. I'm sure everybody in this industry has seen it who has anything remotely related to shooting at long distance. You know, everybody likes to just assume everything is perfect. It's easy to use. But in reality, we live in a complicated world. Take the and velocity off the box, right? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And especially when you're trying to shoot a little <laughs> rock, you know, that big at a target, you know, that's not much bigger really far away i mean it's it's to to have to think that anyone would think that's just like a super simple thing is i mean i guess i can't blame them but right well i think you know my opinion is that six five creedmoor that round has completely changed the mindset of a lot of shooters and it's brought a lot of people 
into long range shooting that never had that capability before. Yes. It's an affordable, there's affordable rifle and there's affordable, repeatable ammo available for that. So we're seeing it, of course, on Kestrel. We hear it all the time. People are going out, they're getting out of the box rifles that have the capabilities to shoot 1,800, 2,000 yards. And now they need all the data yeah. to, to support that. Like, I thought this was 6.5 hit the target more. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, um, yeah. So then you can go in on your Kestrel. You can obviously punch in the distances you're shooting at, you know, if you have good data. Um, yes, yeah, so you build out your gun profile. You have mm-hmm. to know all that data. And, like, you, you made the joke about using the muzzle velocity off the box. Yeah. So it's it's more the BCs off the boxes that I feel sure. like, because muzzle velocity in the Kestrel, you true your muzzle velocity. It's part of using the Kestrel. You, you go in and and true your muzzle velocity, and mm-hmm. then you're really nailing it into your exact gun profile. Mm-hmm. Um, but the BC is typically in question. Using applied ballistics, you're using, even if you use a G1 or G7 BC, if you connect it to the Kestrel Link app, you're pulling in the BC that Brian Litz has tested. Yeah, in the so, Link Ballistics app. Yeah. Correct. Yep, yep. in the Link Ballistics app. Yeah. So you can you don't have to use a custom drag model. There's reasons why people don't. You, you always should if you can, but... If the four of us are going to go out shooting and we want to be able to discuss what we have built in our profile, if I have a custom drag model, I can't see everything to repeat yeah. it or plug it into your Kestrel. Yeah, and, and in regards to that, there there's always going to be people who, uh, use an example before, like if you're taking a match bullet and you're tipping it, using a tipping die, you're changing the BC. So if you're using a custom drag model, it's kind of hard to do that and tweak things. Yeah, mm-hmm. which is now they've started doing this PDM. The, yes. Which is, um, it's, a, it's a game changer, again. Yeah, it's very cool. Applied Ballistics continues to move forward. And that's a personal Personal drag, drag model. model. Yeah. yeah, so people are seeing them in any of the apps that Applied Ballistics works with. You kind of see them and, you know, you'll go and look for, for your exact round that you're going to be shooting. And then you see all these ones with parentheses behind them. And those are personal drag models. Um, those are people that have had the opportunity, like you guys have right now at Akun Rock, is putting your rifles down and shooting your load through your rifle, through the radar, through the Doppler radar, and getting the exact profile of that of that projectile. That's and crazy. It is. And huh. with a personal drag model, it's amazing the results that you can get. You can go out and you can shoot a mile, and you don't have to calibrate anything else. You're good to go with that once you put that personal drag with the right wow. cal, sorry, with the right caliber. You're not going to like take She it. said we yeah, could do yeah. it with a 22. Nope, I heard I did her. not. I heard, <laughs> did not say that. I heard Katie from Kestrel <laughs> say that we can just go out and shoot a mile. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Ruben, I told her no gotchas, and there you go. It's what? like two gotchas in <laughs> one podcast. This is terrible. Yeah. Um, it's fine. Very, very poor example. I apologize. Right. So, um, okay, and then. Let's get into a little bit of connected devices, too. Yeah. Stuff you're connecting in via Bluetooth to your Kestrel. Because there's one very exciting one. It's the one we were testing with a lot today mm-hmm. uh, out at the range, which is the Fury 5000, Fury HD 5000 uh, with AB. AB on board. Mark, what's the look? I'm just, I am love that we're talking about it. Okay, good. I, you look more excited he than I've seen He held his breath for the last 25 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> right, he was really eager for me to say that. Finally. Mark's like, um, I thought we were going to say this right away. <laughs> the <laughs> the Fury, uh, 5,000. The, <laughs> the Fury, though, uh, so you have a binocular with a rangefinder in it, 5,000 yards capable rangefinder, which is pretty awesome. It's got Bluetooth in it. It has the ability to connect to other Bluetooth devices. So you can connect it to an app on your phone. That's got a lot of information mm-hmm. in it. It can actually sense a fair amount of things, but if you really want to go hyper-accurate and get the best of the best and have everything talking to each other the way, um, you know, probably like a lot of the ELR guys or some of the real yep. more uh, technically-oriented PRS competitive shooter guys are probably going to be doing, uh, it can connect to the Kestrel, yep. which is pretty yes. sweet. Yeah, it's amazing. It it's we were using it for the past two days, and it is it's it's game changer. It's right. awesome. Yeah, and it's 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 really easy too. It is. I mean, it's one of those. I think pairing it with Kestrel and just in general the Fury kind of the interface that we had have established over the years with our rangefinders having some similarities in the menu design and similarities in how you function them. People have kind of gotten used to the Vortex rangefinder button layout and how they work. And the Fury 5000, even though it has AB, doesn't complicate that. 
Yeah. So it's a very user friendly interface. And you can still just use it like a regular range. Yeah, you, you can just to. use it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You can use it as a Fury Five Thousand if if you turn off the ballistics mode, which I don't know if you should, but <laughs> um, because it's a crazy awesome experience using it with the ballistics. Yeah. And pairing it with a Kestrel is just the next step. Pair your phone to a Bluetooth speaker. You can pair these things together. Basically. Oh, yeah. pairing was yeah. super easy. Really, yeah. really easy. Yeah. 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 And when you have, you talk about optics, magnification, being able to see your target, boom, there's one very important variable. You should be able to see your target if you're going to shoot it. Uh, then you've got the range, very important variable. And now you're bringing in everything that the Kestrel can bring in with the atmospherics and you've got ballistics. You can either have ballistics on board your Fury, you know, that you put in you that way, or you can have ballistics already on board your Kestrel and they can just communicate that uh, with that. But, I mean, what you end up with at that point is a package that all together in two units that can basically fit in a glass pack on your chest. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's the last step for that mile shot that we were talking about, right? Yeah. Because yeah. you have to see the target. You have to range the target accurately. You have to make sure that you're not hitting the dirt behind it or the dirt in front of it. And, I mean, it was easy, even freestanding without any support, it was easy to hit targets mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. with the Fury. It's it's fun being able to, like, once you, you know, there's work that goes into, and again, you know, put crap in, get crap out. There's work that goes into getting everything set up properly, right, so that you have all the proper data in your Kestrel or in your binocular, or, you know, and all that stuff. But once they're working, though, I mean, it couldn't be easier. We were literally out there and point, shoot the rangefinder, boom, it pops up, what you need to dial, dial that in, take a shot, and... Or hold over. Or hold over. Yeah. That's right. What I, um, what I was really happy, like, pleasantly surprised with was how... You know, and I, we started using in the in the training program here. We kind of started using Kestrel fifty seven hundred elites about three years ago, I think, about two and a half three years ago. Before that, we were using apps that were we were simply taking um, data, chronograph data, bullet data, all that, running it through an app. Sometimes that was A B supported, sometimes it wasn't, but getting good results. But as soon as we started utilizing, like up to the minute atmospherics and having a better understanding of wind, our hit probability on targets like skyrocketed. Mm-hmm. And if you've gotten behind and used a Kestrel, like at first it can be a little scary. There's definitely a learning curve with that, but we didn't have nearly any of that learning curve um, with the Furies when we connected it to a Kestrel it was um, probably a matter of about five minutes before I was really comfortable with it. And so it's not, it should not be a daunting, like, mm-hmm. thought, well, like, well, like I'll buy these Furies and I'll use them and they have range finding and they have, you know, ballistics in them, but I don't know if I want to do the Kestrel because that's another step. It's actually a really easy step. Mm-hmm. And the interface on the Kestrel is literally turn it over to one mode, connected, and yeah. now all of a sudden your Furies are supplied with data on atmospherics on pressure all of that stuff wind yeah and it's it's like plug and play it's super easy so i love talking about when we were out at the range talking about some of the applications that this setup would be used and and explaining you know for someone out there that's like hey this is really cool if you're just like a techie and you're thinking to yourself like i'm over the moon about like this super cool technology that's great but if you're somebody who's like all right practical use you know Mm -hmm. let me think about you know some people can I know originally when I first saw, I was like, am I really going to want to be, you know, pulling this stuff out, measuring, you know, am I going to get out my protractor or whatever? And and it's not the case. But when you guys actually were saying, like, let's say you're a two, two-person hunting team, right? And you have your spotter, so shooter to speak. Shooter spotter, yeah. Shooter spotter situation. And your spotter's on the range finding binos, right? Yep. And they're lazing the deer at X distance or certain spots where you think a deer might come out, whatever it is. The shooter with the Kestrel, because they communicate with one another, can just be getting, every time they lay the target, boom, you know, that could pop up yeah. on the Kestrel, right? So we even, we one-upped that one a little and bit. And yeah, you guys did, because you have the HUD now, We right? have the HUD, yeah. right. So we're going to play around with that. Uh, we're getting some out. We had one out. We're going to shoot them tomorrow. Cool. Um, but it, it mounts right on the weapon system. So that shooter never leaves the glass. They are constantly following whatever whatever they're going after. They don't have to come out of the glass, which is critical. You don't want to lose sight. And then the spotter is just holding the fury 
and just sending updated holds, updated holds. Yep. The Kestrel instantly puts them up on that heads-up display, mm -hmm. and the shooter right out of their non-dominant eye can see it. It's and Bluetooth then, connecting to both devices then. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's the Kestrel. The Kestrel is taking input in from both and sending inf information to both. Okay. So, I think, yeah. I think one thing that's really cool about that, too, is that everybody kind of involved, whether it be Kestrel, Applied Ballistics, Vortex, one of the things that you can do to... Uh, kind of in that shooter spotter role is the app, um, the Fury HD app on your phone can display a lot of that too. So yeah. it's it's not exclusive to only people who want to sp keep spending more and more money. Yep. It's one of those things where, like we said today, if you have that pulled up, whether it be on a Kestrel, on a HUD, on your app on your phone, that same relationship can happen. Shooter to spotter, you know, you don't have to have loud communication between the two it's like okay i'm yeah, ranging the target nonverbal literally yep. silent you yep. know ranging the target okay now the shooter has their phone displayed um they can see their dope they can see mm -hmm. velocity and energy too which is cool mm -hmm. well i was thinking even that's a pretty amazing thing that we'll have to get into even, yeah even just confirming right you might be in a hunting scenario where you know ruben you might whatever i'm making up numbers but like dial dial 5.5 there you go, using and the hunting analogy again, Mark. I, well, it's the only one I truly care about, Jim. Uh, that's not <laughs> true, actually. That's not true. I lied. Everybody, I lied. Uh, but uh, but just even confirming, like, did, did he say 5.5? Or did he did he say, because, like, you're probably whispering, right? And there's and a I, ton going through your head, right? And I can just, yeah. you know, quick reference, you know, what I have going on by me, whether it's the, the Kestrel, the HUD, the the my phone, like I mean, all these things. It's amazing how how the, how they talk mm -hmm. to one another, and yeah. you just have some redundancies built in there. Even um, can you imagine right, how when you're awesome? Oh, sorry, but when you're taking that shot, you don't want to second guess anything. You want to make sure, like, this is 100. percent I I yeah. feel good about this. I still recall a time like when we were in Nebraska. We were up on a hill. Ryan mm -hmm. Muckenhern was trying to make a shot on a deer like 400 yards away. Oh, Remember right, that? and. The deer was kind of crossing in and out of some, I think it was like plum thickets or something yeah. like that. And it would it would kind of go in and it would come out and we you'd lose it for a little bit, and then you'd find it again. And I just remember that like it was we're super up there. fun because it was like this oh, was team effort. Oh yeah, of like everybody's, you know, you were on binos, I had a set of furies, he's on the gun, you know, trying to get set up and ready to go. And but the whole time I'm sitting there like I'm sitting there like it's at 380. And then you'd be like, what? Because yeah. Ryan can't hear anything. Right. You know, yeah. it's at 380. You know, 380, yeah. Oh, wait, no, now it's at four. You know, and, and then like think about this. back and forth, this back and forth. And of course, you're probably like, the, the deer is probably down there at the bottom of this valley where sound is echoing like, what are they on about up What's there? What's going on? So think <laughs> about it. Well, and it's important for like the way we were set up. I mean, this was, mm -hmm. you know, it was actually a super crazy cool long range muzzleloader, right? But it was important for Ryan you know, to be able to stay on the gun, in the glass. Um, because of the way it kept going it, in and out. Like, it was a pretty intense mm -hmm. scenario. And then he ended up, I recall, now unfortunately, it, you know, the shot went, but it missed. Clean mess. Um, but I think he missed because something his dope was off. If I remember right. We checked something. We'll have to get with him. But there yeah, was, there was something where we ended up hitting just a hair low. Literally and I remember that he low, went back and he. I remember low. that he went back and he looked at his dope and at his turret and he was like, "Oh, it yeah. was one of those like it was so it was right in front of my face kind mm. of thing." Yeah. And that's a lot of that probably has to do with the communication aspect. You one know? thing that stuck out to me was what you said, right? You said it's at three eighty. It's at three eighty. Well, there's another step in there before you can shoot, right? He has to figure out the dope for three eighty. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. done now, whether you use a Kestrel or whether you use a rangefinder, uh mm -hmm. like a Fury A B's, it's that's already out of it. So now yeah. now you're not even telling him yardage. Well, as a spotter, it, as a as a shooter, a shooter doesn't care what the yardage is. They need a dope call and a wind call. Yeah. 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 Well and then when it switches to 410, yeah. you know, yep. and you're sitting there and you're like, okay, 380. I've got everything dialed in for 380. I know what 380 is. I know what 380 is. And then the person goes, 410. And you're like, that's totally different. That's right. Yeah. Like, yeah. Is it when you're that's using a muzzle loader, yards. too. I mean, yeah. it's it's a, it's a high performance muzzle loader, but yeah, that's that's enough to to miss. It's all relative. It's a 22 at 100 or 120. It's mm -hmm. a, it's a, you know, a 6.5 at either 1,000 or 1,050. It's even those little changes, like it's all relative to what you're shooting. Mm -hmm. It is. So like, you could complete miss something by having a 30 yard bad range call on a muzzleloader. Yeah. But, but, but yeah, it is, it is really cool too, because kind of like we said with the, having a dope call and having a wind call, like, you know, like I get into all the, like the 
subconscious and the training stuff for competitive shooting and like how how that kind of helps you but really it's kind of been proven that like your conscious mind can only focus truly focus on one task at a time Mm -hmm. and if you're trying to put a round on target and now you're trying to also calculate okay well he gave me 380 but it's 410 now Mm -hmm. i don't have time it's going to take a step into the woods again what are you focusing on are you focusing on a shot or on dope Mm -hmm. or calculating dope in your head and if we can take a step out it, it lets you focus on what you should. And, and I mean, imagine if we get everybody shoot suppressors, there'd be no problems left. Oh, in my world. gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Bring civilized. it right on back to suppressors. So civilized. I'm I'm so guilty of not doing that, but I, have I a solution appreciate for you. it to the nth degree when people do, like even the difference today, like some we had some yes. with, some without, and oh my gosh, su- suppressors, they are magic. I'm going to throw, you know, we're talking about like the team and spotter shooter scenarios, but like mm-hmm. even just using this system, even, but using the system by yourself, w- I can see potential for being yeah. like obviously crazy more effective. I can think of a time where I was shooting at, um, or we had spotted a bear across a canyon, again, kind of moving in and out of, um, you know, brush, trying to get a range on it, get a range on it. And then I'm still a proponent and I will be of taping a dope, a good dope, Sure. Hard to your stock. Like, Absolutely. I mean, yeah, not like, a bad idea. Redundancy. redundancies and yep. backups, and it's all, you know, it's going to be there, right? But that's, that is, that was the system I had in place. I had an accurate rangefinder and I had my dope card on my stock, right? So, range the bear. Okay, he's right there. And now I'm actually having to come off. Not, now I'm not even looking at the bear anymore, trying to get my. Peek uh, over at that dope card? To peek over at the dope card. So I'm like, okay, cool. He's there. Dial that. But then also, you know, th- it's just a little spreadsheet. So I'm like, okay, wait, no, double check, right? By the time yeah, I look doing, back up, I'm like, doing this thing. Okay, yeah, where'd the bear go? Okay, not good. You know, eh, and then you know, I mean, just in and out, and yeah. like rechecking, and and to be able to stay in the optic and be <laughs> more stable. Mark, if it's Mark in a tree stand, the arrow comes unknocked like four or five. That times, happened one time, and Mark- then all of a sudden he just <laughs> rips it back and just lung punches the thing anyway. Do you remember that old Roger Raglan hunting video where he shot the wrong I one? Shot the wrong fuck. <laughs> <laughs> he like looks and fumbles with his rifle and it falls over and he picks it up and he comes back up shoots a deer and it's a little <laughs> it's like classic if you if you kind of like that's a classic grew up with I'll vhs hunting out. tapes let's um, check that out but to brag a little bit on just the fury here as well so let's say you know let's say you don't have the kestrel you should get one but if you don't have the kestrel uh you know then the whole thing though you can plug it all in it's in the app you know mm-hmm. your phone connects to the fury and the fury also and this is this is where i'm getting into whether or not you have the kestrel or you're just using the phone app where you're plugging everything in that you've gotten um, from a ballistics calculator and all that stuff uh, the fury is holding a lot of that information on board too so again if you're the single man team then when you hit that measure button on your target or on your quarry or whatever you're after um, it's going to give you a yardage and it will then also in that display give you the dope as fed to it by your phone app or as fed to it by the Kestrel with the information in the Kestrel. And so that's where you don't have to have a third hand that's like one on the rifle, one on the binocular, one on the, you know. Yeah. It's like, okay, you know, the Kestrel has the brain or the phone has the brain, whatever it is. It's talked to the rangefinder, the binocular, the Fury in this case. That The Fury has all that stored into it as well or they're talking. So boom, when I range it, it'll pop up as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So then you don't have to go be checking something else like, okay, I range that. Now let me go check what the dope is, which is pretty sweet. It is. And it's great that it gives you both the range and your hold. Yeah. Because again, that redundancy of making sure like, is this checking out? Like, is that, mm-hmm. it just told me it's at 600 yards. Is that for real? And you can mm-hmm. kind of, you know, figure out like, oh, you yeah. know what? I, I got excited and I didn't actually range the target properly. Where if it's just giving you your hold, you're like, well, I guess, I guess yeah. that's right. I yeah. mean, you know? to take that to a step, another step and like even if you're not utilizing something like the fury or whatnot like a kestrel is a really good tool to have too in the field i mean especially for hunting if you get to any type of distance where all the atmospherics start to really play into it it can it can make you a more ethical hunter i think absolutely oh for sure Mm -hmm. now ruben or go ahead Kay. no well that is the ethical hunting is one of the things that Mm -hmm. we really you know the kestrel has the capability to go very very far it will, it obviously, I mean, I, I shot 2.2 miles and mm-hmm. I was with Brian Litz, so I had, right. I had a handicap, but you know, 
making those ethical decisions is is what you know we struggle with. We want to make sure that people aren't using their kestrels to go out to such an extreme long range where mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. they aren't doing the ethical hunting. And and you brought up a really good point about the information you can get from your kestrel mm-hmm. or from your fury to make those decisions. Mm-hmm. Well, like one yeah. of them was um, now the fury. I don't believe pops this up, but I know the kestrel does. Is your velocity. Velocity and energy. And energy. The app. Fury will display that in the app. In the app. Okay, yep. so on your phone. So on on your phone. It's called the ballistics Yeah, ballistics display setting of the app. Got it. Mm-hmm. So on your phone or your Kestrel, you can see then, let's say, you range out at... And this is one of the things that necessarily, doesn't necessarily have to happen in crunch time. It's one of those things you might do while you're planning yes. or looking ahead and yes. seeing, okay, something could come out here. You range at, you know, 450 or whatever, and you can see, okay, the muzzle velocity, it's going to tell you, because it has all the ballistics on board, it's going to tell you where your muzzle velocity and, and uh, energy, or I'm sorry, not muzzle, I'm saying muzzle velocity because I'm so used to saying your, that all the time. Yeah, your velocity. The velocity, regular, yep, your, and your, the energy of that bullet at that distance will be, yep. which I don't think a ton of people necessarily are aware of this. I think sometimes people think a bullet is just like, this Binary, magical right? death I like think, ball that goes well, there. Well, if it's a six five creed more, then it is. Well, okay. Well, I think anyway, that anything out of the six five creed more is just a magical death ball where if it touches the thing, it yeah, boom, it goes down. You're saying a lot of people think it's binary. If I hit it, it dies, or if I hit it in the right place, it dies. If I don't, it doesn't. Yeah, it, but it's the very expansion much expansion and how yeah. the bullet actually. There's a lot that still has to happen once the tip actually meets the hide yep. of the animal, the tip of your bullet. That is. A lot has to happen. It's got to expand. It has to go through the cavity. And it has to do the necessary the damage. The right stuff. So there's yeah. some hunting resources out there that will kind of tell you whether it be your local state's DNR or whether it be um, an organization that focuses on hunter education, stuff like that. They'll kind of tell you, like, with this size game, you should be looking to have this much energy on impact. With this size game... Uh, you know, like it can change from a deer to an elk to a bear to a moose, all these different things, right? The amount of energy required to deliver shock and, and shut down vital organs. So there's that. And then there's also the bullet um, right. expansion, right? So like mm-hmm. most, I would say this, a high percentage of bullet manufacturers will publish the the feet per second that the bullet will start to expand and do what it should do. Um, and they give you kind of a minimum velocity and a maximum velocity. Um, talking to one of my buddies from Utah last year, they were actually stalking up this hill and got to the top and there's a bull elk at, um, like 90 yards and they, it didn't see them. They were hid behind some trees. And so he pulled up his Kestrel and looked at it and like his velocity was going to be 3,100 feet per second. And cooking at that rate, the bullet they were shooting will not expand. It will pencil it? right. Fast. It pencils right through. Oh, so is it like a monolithic then? Or yes, something? yes. Okay. So they're shooting monolithic bullet, and so like there's this kind of this window at which you want to be below thousand for this bullet in particular that he was shooting. He needed to be below three thousand feet per second and above fourteen hundred feet per second for that bullet to properly expand upon impact of bone, hide, flesh, all that stuff. And so, I think from a hunter's standpoint, you can look at that and kind of. A, you can just kind of figure out ahead of time what velocity you want to be at. I have taped to the stock of the majority of my hunting rifles, kind of like the the ideal velocity p- foot per second. Um, but that can also change depending on where you are. So your yardage, right, can change. So it's important, I think, to have something that will tell you at what DA you're at or at what elevation um, and the atmospherics you're in how does that bullet fly? So Mm -hmm. hunting here in Wisconsin last year, I'm like, okay, for this gun, that was like, I want to say it was like 512 yards with the specific bullet I was shooting was kind of like the max I wanted to go on, uh, on an elk and came up, you know, range an elk at like 650. And I'm like, okay, it's kind of a little bit past where I want to shoot this rifle. Um, didn't take the shot out of, you know, trying to make sure we were doing everything correctly, being responsible get back, pull up the Kestrel. I'm like, oh, in Colorado, I get an extra 80 yards or extra 100 yards because it's higher altitude, higher Mm -hmm. elevation. So um, having that with you while you're hunting is really critical, I think, especially if you're one of those people who travels a lot and goes different places hunting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Man, there's so much information we have at our fingertips now. There is. It is awesome, for sure. That is cool. I mean, it's wild to think about even just talking about that, 
you know, that evolution of, you know, when I thought uh, entering some data points into a ballistic calculator, I'm like, we've arrived. Yeah. You know, we did, we did it, everybody. <laughs> yeah. And then now it's just like, boom, 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 boom. And it doesn't mean that I'm necessarily taking a longer shot, like right. in a hunting scenario, but I'll probably, I might be taking a better shot. You're, and you're improving your capabilities, right? Mm-hmm. So that yeah. if you, and especially if you're, if you're training at those longer shots, then that easier shot, that, that shorter shot, yeah. that, mm-hmm. that is the shot that you should take. You get take comfortable is, at 800, 400 feels like yeah, nothing. Yeah. Easy oh, yeah. day. Easy day. Yeah. You know, and even going back to what we were doing this morning and talking about, you know, the, that microclimate stuff or, or things that are happening, you know, at, at your location, it's amazing. You know, we always talk about the dreaded wind, right, when it comes to long-range stuff. And, <laughs> and this is an, an exceptionally long shot, but I think it was like 500 yards, right? And we had a left-to-right wind, and uh, I literally dialed the shot and then got in the scope. I wasn't looking at the flag, and then and Nick was like, no, actually, uh, same uh, wind switched opposite direction. <clears throat> I mean, this is when, then a matter of seconds, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wind yeah. switched Coon opposite Rock direction. Is weird too. And it was, uh, I guess, it was an equivalent hold going the exact opposite opposite way. And this is a six five Creedmoor, and you, you're so not I supposed was, to have to hold wind with that. <laughs> Seriously, it, exactly. Six five laser. Um, man. But uh, it's, it just goes to show, I guess, how critical like having that information is for executing a good shot. And it wasn't a lot of wind either well think mm. about too. think about every time you've ever sat with <laughs> with your hunting buddies or sat at a bar and talked to people about shooting and and it's like well i you know i had this thing at 300 yards and i shot and i missed you know like must have been bad ammo must have been my barrel shot out my scope's broken like things broken maybe mm-hmm. you just didn't realize there was a 12 mile an hour crosswind yeah you know, yeah, because a possible. lot of times we are sheltered wherever we're yeah, shooting from. Yeah, it's a sheltered place, whether you're just target shooting or you're out hunting. And where that bullet's gonna fly, it, it doesn't have that shelter. So, applying the wind, it's it's always the debate anytime you talk about a kestrel because we measure wind, but we measure wind at the muzzle. We yeah, know, right there. And, but it's also the only known that you have. Yeah. So, you have to be able to then apply that throughout the entire flight path and decide where the most important wind is. Um, if it's gusting up more, you know, we've all um, shot in winds where it's a left to right and then down by the target, it's it switches to right to left and that right to left is stronger. So you're actually holding in that direction rather than what your body, like what that wind hitting your face feels like you should be doing. Yeah, It's a lot like uh, when you watch the golf pros on the green, you know, just the way that, the you know, they can... They'll hit it to the left, then it curves to the right, yeah. and then it curves back to the left. Watching those long putts always makes me think of long range shooting a lot, you know, just yeah. because it's of all so the precision cool. involved and all the influences on the ball. But that's uh, what's cool about the Doppler that AB has down here is you can watch the bullet now, and you can see when it shifts in that Doppler. Man. Yeah, yeah. That's weird. science. It is pretty cool. Science. It's pretty neat. And yes, and in regards to putting, I always just hit it as hard as I can, so I don't have to play the green, mm, and that doesn't work. No. Hmm. Bounces right over it. <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah, Katie, it's been great chatting with you about all this stuff. Um, and uh, I know I have to get a Kestrel. <laughs> yes. I played with all the ones here, you know, but like, but, but, you know, just when I go other places or whatever, and I'm like, whatever elevation I'm at, or, you know, or, or yep. when we travel for other shooting things, it just, it, uh, and especially with the new Fury. It would yeah. be a great yeah. thing to communicate with that. And it's so. also good to learn the winds, right? So you just use yeah. the Kestrel just to figure out what wind speed is. Yeah, I actually know someone who got a Kestrel and they got just the base model, but they did it to just sit like on their front porch and just try and estimate, you know, yeah. wind. Because like another feature within the Fury as well is is if you don't have the Kestrel, you know, you have to just rely on your own gut feeling of what the wind is you can input wind values Mm -hmm. and you can say you know i think you know i got a five mile an hour crosswind or whatever um you can even choose what direction it's coming from because it has a compass built in super cool um but yeah uh one of my buddies actually got one just so that he could stick it in the air and say oh this feels like five and then check it and oh no i'm off Mm -hmm. or like you know now i'm dead on you know i I know what that feels like every time you take the dog out for a walk you just calibrate yourself and like and then even getting to know the vegetation in your area you know like what wind speeds making that bend over at 90 degrees what what's happening here yeah yeah and i I can't remember who we were talking to at one point in time but there it is you know obviously you measure it at your location right which is like phenomenally important but they'd look over there and be like hmm 
what are those trees doing over there? And then they would guess, right? But then they'd also go over to where those trees are or wherever that grass is at that distance and go, huh, so that's what it is, you know? But then they have that visual uh, right. from my perspective, from where I'm at, I can look at that, but then I can also go over there and measure and it. And measure it, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. You know who that was that I was talking about? It's actually Aaron's husband, Ryan, who work, Aaron who works right. here. And Ryan listens to the podcast. So, hey, Ryan, keep it up with the Kestrel thing. Um, so <laughs> anyway, but yeah, uh, it's been great chatting with you and thanks for, uh, thanks for all your help too at the range. That's been sweet. Yeah. I'm um, so excited to be able to come out here and visit you guys and see this amazing facility. It's been, it's been a treat. Cool. No, thank you. Super, yeah. super informative from my end. And I, I left today. Actually, I pulled Ruben aside. I said, God, man, I think I need a Kestrel. <laughs> I agree. Well, it sounds like you've got your Zoom things that you're doing too yeah. now as well for people. So I'm thinking like anybody out there who's got questions around the Kestrel and stuff like that, where's the best place for them to go? So actually our YouTube channel probably has, because okay. we'll even post some of the classes on there. But following us on social media is Kestrel Ballistics is the easiest way. We post all of our classes up on there. You can follow us there and then sign up for classes. All right. Good deal. It's awesome. Well worth it. That's where you got to go. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody, for listening, as usual, and we'll catch you next time. Again, stay tuned. Some of these little bonus episodes from this uh, collab visit thing going on with the new Fury, uh, we will have AB on next to talk about some other crazy stuff, too, that'll probably blow our minds. So, yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks, guys. Sweet. It sounds so weird in there. Oh, in the headphones. Oh, yeah. it's nice, isn't it? It is. I'm glad you brought up night tones because I was like, we we're looking at the flags, right? Which generally you'd use a Kestrel, but we were literally shooting from like inside a house. I love that idea, house. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm glad you kind of qualified that with like, yeah, sometimes you're shooting from a sheltered location where... Mm-hmm. Um, sheltered wings. Yeah. I don't know that happened to me at one or of you the... Or you have ri- dirty air. Like if you're sitting on top of the berm, the wind may be coming straight up and like rising up through there, so it's gathering speed because it's building up. So oh. it looks like it's a heavier wind speed, and it's not. Oh, dirty air. I love when people talk about dirty air. Not because it's like dirty talk, That's another, but. <laughs> there's another band name. Dirty air is a very interesting topic too. Yeah. Especially, my brother and I have gotten into reading about like race car aerodynamics and like dirty air with all that and pressures and stuff. It's pretty, pretty yeah, wild. Yeah, so our Kestrel, the, I think it's a 5200, but that has, so it, it's all for engine tuning. So, yeah. you know, like at different density altitudes, all of that, like it's the same, it's the same kind of thought process of calibrating a bullet. It's the same as calibrating your engine. Okay. I need to get one now. That's like unquestioned. Well, now you need two. You need the drag racing one and you also need the. Exactly. All right. One. Two. Add the <laughs> card. <laughs> Add the <laughs> card. Yes. All right. That'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks everybody for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation podcast. Again, everybody, thanks and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.